Welcome to Hard Knock Life. I'm Keith Chow. I'm Dominic Ma. How you doing, Keith? All right. It's just the two of us. Sean is still on his sabbatical. Jamal and Brittany couldn't make it, but it's just us. We got a big show. We got a lot of things to talk about. Later in the show, Sophia Soto, our newest contributor to the Nerds of Color, has an interview with the showrunners of Supergirl, which is coming back for its final season this week. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, Dominic, speaking of the DC Universe... Have you finished Justice League or Zack Snyder's Justice League? <laughs> Look, I can't, I can't get into this habit of calling it Zack Snyder's Justice League. I mean, do we call the Avengers movies like the Russoverse, or you know, <laughs> it's it's not gonna be a, to me. It's 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 the Justice League movie. Yeah. And yes, I did watch the last two hours of it, and after a thoughtful and you know surprisingly reflective beginning half the second half i feel is just like a big noisy (laughs) come shot of like parademons and tridents you know it 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 was sort of it's sort of the same but with more slow motion to me (laughs) well like i said last time there is a good two and a half hour movie in there in that four hour assembly cut like you could condense it into a really solid justice league film to your point, it's not a Justice League movie. It's a Justice League streaming series because that's how you treated it, right? You watched, you watched it in chunks, yeah. as if it were like the Falcon and Winter Soldier. Yeah, right? I think it's an effective miniseries, and you know, like Endgame, the last hour is just this orgasm of violence. And okay, okay, I'm just gonna be a jerk and compare it to the Avengers because let's do it. Let's be real. It's only these two movies that have this problem to solve, right? The Avengers and the Justice League. They have to do basically the same thing. So, I mean, you know, so I'm enjoying this the new version of Justice League, but I kept, I, I realized about a third of the way through it that I was looking for them to do a couple of things that never really happened, and that did happen in the Avengers. And I look at this, they're kind of stuff, you know, they spent all the money in the world on this Justice League movie twice. So there's, <laughs> no, there's no excuse for, like, oh, we didn't have time to shoot it. No, you, right. you, you had time and money to shoot everything. There's a six-hour cut that's still still out there. So to me, there are these three things that were made the first Avengers movie work, you know, and I think they they would have helped this Justice League movie. For one thing, there wasn't really the scene where all the team members specialize in something that lets you know why they're this team of diverse characters and not just like for Wonder Woman, or why can't Wonder Woman do all this by herself? <laughs> you know, like, like there's there, there's sort of a, the nice scene in The Avengers where, you know, Cap takes charge and just doles out responsibilities. And you're like, oh, yeah, Iron Man does that, and then Hulk goes to Smash. And that sort of gives the argument for why it would be, you know, why it's this team of weirdos instead of just, you know, Superman doing all the shit that he can do. You know, for example, like, if, there's, if the mission is to go distract a big horde of parademons, like... Isn't the Flash really the guy you want to send on that mission? <laughs> not like, the Batmobile? Yeah, not like Batman on his weird death trip. Like, I'm, I'm going to go out there with my least powered self and, you know, serve as a distraction for the whole horde of parademons. Why don't we send Flash running around just to freaking tease their mobs? Well, I think to your point about, like, not giving each character their moment, in that end scene especially, one easy thing that you could have done at the script stage is set it near the ocean. Yeah. So that Aquaman can do something. Because all Aquaman does is, like, just punch things. Yeah, he's just stab, another stab bruiser. And form. you're like, why doesn't Wonder Woman <laughs> just hit the guy twice instead yeah. of taking turns hitting him? <laughs> but if, if this was at, like, if it was, like, Fukushima, where the where the power plant is on the water, right? Then you could have Aquaman controlling the oceans and you know, riding a dolphin or some shit, right? Like, it doesn't, like, Aquaman has no purpose in the big fight other than to be the big strong guy. And that's kind of an issue with Zack Snyder. I think Zack Snyder fetishizes superheroes, but what he fetishizes about superheroes is that they're just big strong guys. Even Wonder Woman, like, he loves the strength of Wonder Woman, which is great, because I think that scene, despite the murder that happens, the bank Mm -hmm. scene in the opening hour of Justice League where Wonder Woman saves the school kids Mm -hmm. from the terrorists, is a very effective use of Wonder Woman's abilities. Like, that you don't see even in the Wonder Woman movies. The way she deflects the bullets, the way that she, 
like just straight murders people. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I guess with the added violence, it was way more dramatic than it was in the Whedon cut. You're right. The Whedon cut is like two. She dodges two bullets and then it's over. Yeah. I mean, again, as much as I like this version of the Justice League, it is still full of a bunch of Zack Snyder bullshit, and that's sure what makes it Zack Snyder's Justice League, right? right. And you just kind of <laughs> have to go with it. You know, because I've seen the reviews and I've heard the podcasts of the folks who really hate it. And they hate it. There's not, They're never going to like it because it's Zack Snyder. And if you hate Zack Snyder's style, and I'm not a fan of Zack Snyder's style, <laughs> but I can accept it. It's like going into a Tim Burton movie and saying, why the fuck are all these candy swirls everywhere? Like, right, right. You're going into a Tim Burton movie. Like, if you're mad about the candy swirls, don't watch a Tim Burton movie, right? Right. It's, it's part of the deal. If you're mad about scantily clad buff people punching each other's bones out. And slow motion shots of in slow uh, motion. <laughs> bullet, you know, cartridges <laughs> falling. You'll love those. In, in, in like speed ramps. Then don't watch, like, then you're never going to watch a Zack Snyder movie, right? Like, so they're just directorial things that you just kind of have to go yeah. with. And, and I understand that. And it's not your cup of tea. No one's making you drink it. That said, that's my problem with most superhero movies is that the last third is usually just explodey explodey overkill yeah. but but okay but going back to avengers just quickly they did a couple th- tricks to make it work and the, the two other tricks i think that they missed out was there wasn't a really cool shot tracking all of them during the big horde fight to get you again give you the sense that they're doing it together in avengers they do this it's a massive cgi shot okay it looks artificial but it's using the power of the artificial to show you oh they're swooping around this huge city and they're all in this together it's very effective on that point. You don't quite have that in Justice League. Again, you don't really get the sense they're all in the They're all just bashing at the Horde from different angles. And then finally, does anyone eat food in the movie? I mean, Flash eats some snacks. Yeah. But again, this is like a, an effective filmmaking trick. Is like, you know, you have scenes like where people eat food to remind you that they're human. And that shawarma scene in the Avengers does a lot. I will say my favorite scene... In Zack Snyder's Justice okay. League, bar none, to, to your point, is when Alfred and Diane are making tea in the yes. Batcave. Yes. That's the best, literally the best. When that scene happened, I was like, that's awesome. I yeah. can't believe this isn't a Zack Snyder movie. Yeah. You're really with them. Yeah. Right. It shows the humanity of Diana. You see how exasperated Alfred gets when she's making the tea. And it actually sells me on Jeremy Irons as Alfred. Like, I was never quite sold on his Alfred just because in Batman vs. Superman, he's just... He's fucking Jeremy Irons. Like, he's like, that's what makes men cruel. Like, of course, yeah, yeah. Jeremy Irons would say something like this, but not Alfred. Yeah. <laughs> you know? He's <laughs> weirdly fever. like the indestructible <laughs> CIA handler guy. He doesn't yeah. seem to care about, like, tea or stuff. Like, yeah. the darkest Alfred ever, yeah, right? Like, he's, he, he's Ozymandias from Watchmen, like, literally, yeah. <laughs> you know? But in this movie, he's witty. He and bruce have banter and the scene with with diana like bar none was my favorite i was like wow i can't believe there's humanity in a Zack snyder movie so i get what you mean like other than that scene there isn't any other scene quite like that i mean the only other scene that involves food is quite ridiculous and it's the hot dogs and the sesame right. seeds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and and aquaman you know brings some fish but mainly he drinks he, he drinks <laughs> yeah he's got, and, he, and he also litters in the ocean which is weird for yeah. aquaman like <laughs> Throwing his Jack Daniels in the, into the water. Yeah, he just know. throws things around. If Arthur would really do that. But what did you think of the uh, epilogue? Epilogue was okay. <laughs> Talking about like a bunch of uh, overindulgent bullshit that you don't need at the end of a movie. What did you think yeah, of? Yeah, wait, if you... Oh, God. The nightmare. It, it was ridiculous. But I, I will say, I, <laughs> I mean, I'm getting happy with the idea that Harley Quinn is the nexus of the multiverse will bring it all together maybe we'll get to that in a minute it was suicide squad so i'm glad she was also mentioned in there in though in a casually totally brutal way that suggests that like Batman was like choking her to death while she like squeaked out her last words about the fucking joker yes no as, as i remember you brought it like it's just as well we don't see where this plot line was headed i think it was yeah. some version of the you know grant morrison jla storyline where you know, Dark Side comes to Earth, and Lois gets killed, and Superman goes on a crazy, whatever, self-hating rampage. Probably would have seen Jason Todd getting whacked to death. Uh, none of this was none of this was good. Um, none of this none of this was going to be good, and yeah. it would lead us back to this place of Batman versus Superman, which is sort of unnecessary, plotless brutality. Yeah, thank God. And you know, everyone out there that's hashtagging restore the Snyderverse, like. One, this was always going to be predicted, right? Like, this is what everyone warned about 
in even doing the Snyder Cut is that folks who have been begging for the Snyder Cut are not just going to be like, oh, thank you for the Snyder Cut. Yeah. Right? Because now it's it's morphed into Restore the Snyderverse. Right. I mean, and I was really curious about that part because, again, I wondered if this was just all a big ramp up in marketing and, like, like many things are, you know, in our fan existence, there's this huge anticipation build. And in this way, the release Snyder Cut thing was just adding to the anticipation like, you know, the way an exciting trailer does. And whether it would just, you know, like a lot of these things fade in retrospect. Like we wouldn't care about it so much more. Maybe it will go on. I don't know. I mean, like, can I just say there's there's nothing to me that sums up the weirdness of the whole situation more than that disclaimer at the beginning that says this film is presented in 4.3 to respect the original vision of the creator. I mean, that's a little odd, okay? I mean, to my understanding, it's presented in 4.3 because it was meant to be shot on IMAX, and that's IMAX's native format, right? Or is it, it was, it was meant to, IMAX was supposed right. to be a big, you know, venue for it. Yeah, ironically, he doesn't shoot any of the scenes in IMAX, though, right? Because at least with, like, Batman vs. Superman or the Christopher Nolan movies, he'll shoot actual IMAX cameras. And there okay. is no point in Justice League where he uses an IMAX oh, camera. Oh, really? Okay, so that makes it even stranger. Plane. Yeah, it's very strange. <laughs> okay. I mean, I would be interested if, you know, the pandemic is over and movie theaters are open and, you know, an IMAX theater nearby says, we're going to project the Snyder Cut. You know, I would be interested. Yeah, because it's big. Right. Perhaps a, uh, you know, condensed version of the Snyder Cut I wouldn't mind sitting in a movie theater to watch. But I, I would say that the the vertical framing to me works i just think it's wild that you do that on tv because the only way people are watching the snyder cut is on their televisions or on their iphones or on their ipads and then doing it in four or three on everyone's widescreen televisions is super weird yeah i just thought it's strange i mean maybe i'm being old school (laughs) because i thought we did all this work to you know, transfer over to the widescreen standard (laughs) i was going back it's like why doesn't he just shoot it like you know in the in the TikTok frame, you know, just want to make it a whole <laughs> just make it completely vertical. Vertical, <laughs> if you like. I mean, that was what I mean. Like, uh, honestly, that was the thing that so sucks about the Whedon Whedon version was that it starts with this stupid like social media right. vertical frame of Superman that is like I get what he's trying to do is trying to make it like personal, intimate, but it makes it like so off putting. Yeah, stupid, normal that like there's no sense of scope. You just you're just watching. Oh, and, an then, act, and then and then. Cow's fucked up mouth. Yeah, with a fucked up mouth and his <laughs> actor in a suit. Wow, great. Yeah. And you can even tell, though, like, it's the square frame that was meant to be cropped because there's so much space above and below. Yeah. Right? Like, I actually did this, and God help me. God help you anyway, Keith. <laughs> it may seem like I'm a Snyder stan because I've seen this movie now three and a half times. Wow, that's really... <laughs> that's more than a full solar day i might need I help like, okay. <laughs> the reason i say three and a half because i watched it in full twice i had a screener so i watched it for my review okay like, a week before the movie came out and then i watched it doled out in parts with the family who have still not forgiven me for this and then i watched it a third time on my monitor zoomed in okay to fill the frame oh to yeah to see yeah. If the movie would look any different in 16 by 9. Yeah. And it doesn't. Like, what I mean by you you don't lose anything. Because that's the whole... Yeah. That was the selling point. Is that in 4.3, you actually get to see more picture. Which is true. There's more image at the top and the bottom. But it was meant to be cropped. Because when you zoom in, you don't lose any information. There's nothing yeah. vital in the top and bottom of the frame. That you could watch the movie zoomed in. And I say half because I did watch parts of it in its Justice is Grey black and white version. <laughs> Which is... <laughs> because... So like even more old school in the frame in this I was curious, you know, like HBO Max released it this week in black and white. And, you know, if you follow Twitter and you follow the Snyder stands on Twitter, it's the greatest moment in cinema history mm. to see a four hour black and white movie in four by three. And I'm like, have you people never heard of Seven Samurai? Wow. like if you want a four hour four by three epic in black and white on hbo max yeah maybe maybe that's what they're going for seven samurai is there right there you could just click over to seven samurai and and i'm trust me you'll get your money's worth that said i mean i i i get why too like the imax presentation and there is a like verticality 
that makes sense in the way he frames his superheroes but it's pretentious ultimately <laughs> yeah no it's, just... it, it's super pretentious <laughs> and it's just in line with their like you know how much we're honoring the artist's vision here because twitter said we had to which i think yeah. is it, it will be the continuing question as we go forward but it's also interesting the point if dc could at this late point reframe themselves as the studio that actually cares about the writer director's vision as as far as like Kirsten mentioned their name for example like in the upcoming suicide squad movie where they will you know take pains to mention it's sort of a james gunn product you know as opposed to marvel you know what you mentioned again uh, many times is sort of you know a factory in the sense that like they don't do a lot of emphasis on who's <laughs> who's making right. the movie who's directing because kevin feige ultimately makes the movie it's yeah. the it's the tv model where the showrunner has ultimate say and the directors are just work for hire who come in and out this week dc also dropped their sequel trailer for the suicide squad and you know this is a good transition because going back to what we were saying about restore the snyderverse there is a loud contingent of fans who are upset with the suicide squad is even though like it was a pretty fantastic trailer i will have to admit mostly because it kind of is wb doubling down on we're not restoring a snyderverse we are in fact giving directors carte blanche to do whatever the hell they want with these characters and that's evident from the james gunniness of the suicide squad trailer and it's also obvious in just the direction that dc has gone post snyder right patty jenkins Definitely putting her stamp on Wonder Woman. Birds of Prey is a Kathy Yang, Christina Hodson collaboration. You have Matt Reeves' Batman that's in the DC canon. Yeah. Todd Phillips' Joker. Right. I mean, for better or for worse, universe. there's more individual filmmaker voice going on and less like fitting to the specs of right. the shared universe. Which is what has allowed me to appreciate the Snyderverse. Like, back in 2016, when everything said, this is the next 20 years of DC films... It felt, to your point, brutalist and oppressive. Like, oh my god, I can't imagine an entire generation knowing only this version of Batman and Superman. The fact that you can say Snyder lives in his own pocket universe, and the Patty Jenkins movies are their own thing. Like, without even worrying about, like, a multiverse or a cinematic universe, right? Just let the films kind of be what they are, like the comics. Yeah, they involve the same characters. Right. But they're a distinct version of all those characters and you know dc was also more like that than marvel marvel was definitely more of a interconnected even in the comics like you would see the baxter building in a spider-man comic but in dc like you had wildly different interpretations that's why they needed a crisis on infinite earths just because there were just so many interpretations they thought okay let's make a continuity but their strength has always been they can swing from like goofy 50s boy scout superman to Superman for All Seasons Superman, to Grant Morrison Superman, you know, as long as the core of Superman is the same. And I think this is where Zack Snyder misses the mark, is that his core Superman is never the core of Superman, right? To him, the core of Superman is alien God who could burn it all down Mm -hmm. and never alien God who is actually the most human person on the planet. That's never the Zack Snyder Superman. And that's Ultimately, yeah. why I don't want his version of the Snyderverse because I don't need three more movies of evil Superman burning the shit down. Like that's why we have the Boys and Invincible and Brightburn. Like right. <laughs> everyone's got the evil Superman story, but we right. haven't in a long time had the moral good Superman. And right. That's the one thing I liked about Whedon's version, honestly. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm not enough of a Superman stand to debate the fine points of that but uh, but i take your point but i mean what did we think of that uh, suicide squad trailer because <laughs> i mean i think it's interesting you know speaking again of the multiverse it is basically another movie called suicide squad after there was a movie called the Su- suicide squad <laughs> say two or three years ago and we're we're all just okay with that and again the loose connective tissue through all this is is harley quinn <laughs> which i think is great you know she was <laughs> in that first suicide squad movie which definitively is connected to the Snyder Justice League verse and then she was in that Birds of Prey movie which is maybe like a slight slight sidestep away but in the same basic area now she's in you know another version of the Suicide Squad <laughs> which has basically uh, like none of the same people except her basically and may or may no, not 
Viola Davis is in it. She's reprising Amanda Waller. So she was Amanda Waller yes. in the first one. Joel Kinnaman is... It Back also may be Amanda flag. Waller who brings it all together, you know, because she's always three really lurking behind the scenes. She should have been the Nick Fury of the DC Universe if they were going to do that. Yeah, that would have worked if they wanted to do that. But I think it's interesting, right? Because one of the knocks against the first Suicide Squad movie, and, you know, to David Ayer's consternation, is that the studio stepped in like they did with Justice League and hacked his version of the movie. In fact, talking about hashtags, there's a whole release, the air cut of Suicide Squad. Mm. Not that I want to see that. I don't think I want to see that. Other than a curiosity, right? Like, Which is how I felt about the Snyder cut of Justice League, so who knows. But the, the irony of all of this is that when he made Suicide Squad, he, he says that his Suicide Squad was much darker, much more violent and oppressive. <laughs> like Again, like a Snyder movie. And the studio freaked out and was like, no, we need to make this into a Guardians of the Galaxy. And uh-huh. the final product is like a wild Frankenstein, like let's let's try to make this a James Gunn movie after the fact. And they, there's like yeah. 12 needle drops in the first five minutes of Suicide Squad. <laughs> just because like Guardians of the Galaxy had 70s rock in it. Let's just do yeah, all yeah. of the 70s rock in the first 10 minutes. So the, the, the irony that they go out and actually get James Gunn yeah. And say, make your Suicide Squad movie the Guardians of the Galaxy movie that we tried to make the first Suicide Squad movie. And seemingly is successful. It's just from the trailer. Right. He's he's put his stamp on it. I thought it was I thought the Suicide Squad trailer was pretty funny. And you know, like funny is very subjective. Like I'm in the school, I didn't actually think the Guardians of the Galaxy movies were that funny, but mm-hmm. I appreciate that they were having fun. Mm-hmm. And you know, the, I just I well, laughed out loud at the Suicide Squad trailer because that dick joke repartee is my kind of dick joke. Whatever. <laughs> <Your mileage. laughs> Maybe very. But I mean, definitely all the tropes are all there. I mean, they've got the funny creature who doesn't speak very much English and mm-hmm. is a behemoth bruiser. And they seem to have some smaller furry creatures and they, you know, and they, they have the lead guy with a gun. I think the biggest thing is it's a bunch of Z-list characters that ultimately yeah. no one gives a shit about, right? Like Polka Dot Man is in a movie before you know hawkman <laughs> you know yeah, like, thank you <laughs> like, there are a bunch of highly obscure characters who can all die right yeah <laughs> i mean yeah, and yeah, there yeah. won't be a huge uproar because that's the appeal of guardians of the galaxy i don't even know if appeal is the right word but like that's the trick of guardians of the galaxy that we've talked about multiple times on this podcast is that for the general public the guardians of the galaxy are a bunch of nobodies yeah like like even comic book fans before that movie couldn't name four guardians of the galaxy right and now somehow rocket raccoon and groot and star lord and gamora and nebula are household names that five-year-olds wear rocket raccoon costumes at halloween is wild to me and if the suicide squad can do that to king shark and polka dot man and peacemaker like characters (laughs) i could give two shits about in the comics i think it's really funny their commitment to captain boomerang i mean he's even going to be in the video game version and he was in the arrowverse version what what was why 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 the consistent appeal of captain boomerang like obnoxious australians just gotta be in i know i think that's just a funny thing about suicide squad right i mean and the one thing they do have is is an a-lister in harley quinn yeah to kind of tie it all together. that's the one thing guardians never had was was an a-lister so you know, good good on them. And are we also happy that there's Starro? I'm very excited there's a kaiju because just on the list of tropes in the superhero movies, in, in formats I would like to see, it's the super team against big giant thing format. We haven't really seen that. And we have, you know, visual effects that can do anything. Let's let's get that one. I have two thoughts on Starro in the Suicide Squad trailer. Thought number one, since you've now finished the Snyder Cut, there are two scenes in which Steppenwolf in the Snyder Cut puts a little spidery alien on people's faces to read their minds. Yeah. <laughs> and in my mind, that was a Starro reference. I was like, holy shit, Zack Snyder is digging into the crates and pulling out a Starro reference. That's one awesome, but also fucked up because why is a Starro reference in an R-rated superhero movie, right? Okay. Because Starro in and of itself should not ever be in an R-rated film. And I said that in my Snyder Cut review. Fast forward two weeks later, in a very R-rated Suicide Squad trailer, there's not only a Starro reference, but fucking Starro himself. I had to go and retract my, you can't have Starro in an R-rated superhero movie, because, by God. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's that's going to be awesome. And you only yeah. see him in, like, a monitor in the background. You don't actually get to see the full scene. My hope is that it's not the Suicide Squad fighting Starro, but it's, like, 
little tiny CG versions of the Justice League fighting Starro because that would be okay. Maybe the great reference because yeah. that that was their first bad guy. The Justice League fought Starro the way the Avengers first fought Loki. So I want to yeah. see that in the background. Yeah, he had that hugeness that it was necessary for them to come together. Unlike Grumpy Cat Steppenwolf, which is another flaw <laughs> of that movie. But yeah, no, I take that point. I think they were just like test marketing the Starro idea. <laughs> in the Justice League thing to see how it go. Also, because I mean, there is, there are Dark Side invades storylines where he has something similar, a sort of gross thing that attaches. Your... By the sure. way, for people who don't know or don't care, Starro is a giant <laughs> starfish-shaped <laughs> alien in the DC comics, and he makes little starfishes that attach to your face, and then you're mind controlled by him. It's unclear whether they'll do the mind control right, right, facing right. or not because that's kind of gross. I mean, it kind of like the reason, the whole reason I was so thrown off by the possible Starro reference in. Justice League is that Zack Snyder famously got rid of the giant squid in Watchmen. So I just thought oh. this is his way of atoning <laughs> for like having the giant kaiju out giant of his other DC <laughs> movie by by at least nodding to a potential version of that giant kaiju in his Justice League. So I could be wrong. Maybe it was just that he thought this is a cool metal spider and it has nothing to do. It just happens to be purple, look like a star when it's on your face and read your mind. So No, it's very observant, Keith. Maybe <laughs> maybe, maybe it's Mecha Starro. <laughs> and, you know, they're, they're supposed to be in collaboration in some grander plan of the DC Universe, which will never happen. But <laughs> at least we'll have some kind of Starro. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I mean, James Gunn's little dabble into the DC Universe, I think I'm, I'm excited for it. I can't wait to see it. You know, I'm not opposed to R-rated superheroes. I just don't think Superman and Batman should be R-rated, I think, is my ultimate issue. But I'm down for an R-rated Suicide Squad. King Shark is having his moment. He's, he's going to be the new Groot. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, people love their King Shark. It's wild that we live in a world where King Shark has multiple versions to pick from because he had several arcs on the Flash TV series. He's a big part of the Harley Quinn animated series. And now he's going to be voiced by Sylvester Stallone in the Suicide Squad uh-huh. movie. So is it because of Sharknado and Shark Week and things like that? Is <laughs> that guess. really why sharks are have to be brought up? And Baby Shark. There's that mm-hmm. too. Okay. And, and the funny thing is like, after all this, James Gunn is coming back to the Marvel Universe because he's going to do Guardians three. So it's not like, you know, he's he's they're sharing him across the across the multiverse. Both Marvel and DC get to have a little James Gunn goodness in their film canons. Speaking of Marvel Studios, we didn't forget there was another. Usually we start our podcast with the recap of the latest Marvel TV show. Yeah. We were missed we'll- to not talk about Falcon and Winter Soldier episode two. We'll continue to do that after we've more digested the 11,000 hours of Justice League. (laughs) Yeah. It it, it might take several months. But what did you think of uh, episode two of F-A-T-W-S? Well, mainly it was that part where they asked the interesting question, whether we're going back to normal. The interesting and relevant question, I should say, and the question that makes, you know, the hero villain conflict like richer than just like let's go explode their truck yeah are we sure the flag smashers are bad guys yeah basically that's what i'm asking did you get any sense that they were a threat from it i mean aren't they what they're literally do they have a truck with vaccines going to a refugee camp or something yeah is it actually indicated what they're threatening well yeah they're they're stealing from the government and you know corporate power right like their motto is one world one people which sounds like a pretty dope motto (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Organization. Yeah. I almost feel like that should be the Nerds of Colors motto going forward. Yeah. One and we world, understand one. revolutions with good ideals get out of control. Sure. That's probably what the model they're going for here is. But it's especially relevant at this time when we're all, how the blip maps onto the pandemic and we're, yeah. we're all asking that specific question. Well, do we want to go exactly back to normal? Like, is that what, like, do we want to just go back to exactly how things were? That's like a serious question. And you know, there's one criticism I've read about falcon Winter soldier so far is that they do seem to kind of tiptoe around like real life questions like police brutality in this episode or the fact that black people can't get loans in the last episode right Mm. without actually going into it they deploy it in a careful way yeah and i i do feel like that that criticism might be too early because i I do want to see how it all ties together because there's definitely like you don't bring that up if you're not going to address it it's like Chekhov's racism right you don't bring it up in the first act if it's not going to come up later and you know john walker in the comics has a history of being a white supremacist so right the u.s agent version of of captain america has to kind of point in that direction that you bring up these little examples of racism in the marvel universe 
to come to a head at some point. Because the other thing about the Flag Smashers is that they're not just a revolutionary group of people trying to, like, help others. Like, there's a line where they say, people think of you as Robin Hood. Like, they're a diverse Mm. group of people doing it. (laughs) Like, the Flag Smashers are, like, brown folks who are helping, you know, refugees, as you said. So, like... Are we sure they're the bad guys is my whole question. Like, yeah, I mean, it seems very, it just just seems on formula, like, why they're the bad guys so far. Basically, Falcon and Winter Soldier, Soldier go and, like, pick a fight with them just because they're in the back of Warehouse. They must be doing something bad. It was very reminiscent of the Mandalorian episode where Mando was on an Imperial, like, you know, oil refinery rig. And they were being attacked by, like, the locals. Because the, yeah. the locals don't want the Empire there to, like, fuck up their planet. And, like, but it's framed as, like, he's basically murdering all of these locals who are trying to stop the rig. And, like, it's supposed to be this cheer. Like, you see the Empire, like, yeah. cheering when they cross the bridge. And you're like, but you right. showed Bill Burr being sympathetic towards their plight, in, like, five right. minutes earlier. And now you're just murking them. But it sort of scans there because the Mandalorian is, like, a lawless Western cowboy. Sure, Let's sure. He's not, he's not the <laughs> agent, agent of uh, change and positivity but okay but wait i mean i mean back to like some of the you know historical context that's starting to be laid out in the falcon series i mean what a messed up scene really with the other super soldier the black super soldier isaiah bradley, isaiah bradley. interesting that he showed up and really kind of a messed up impactful scene that was what well, that's what i'm saying though like you can't you can't not go there if you're bringing in kyle baker's truth red white and black into the story right like you have yeah. to deal with race in the marvel universe and i applaud them i hope they do it though like i i don't want them to just i hope that's not the only scene carl lumbly's in i don't think he would cast carl lumbly to play isaiah bradley and then just leave it be for the rest of the episode but i am concerned because unlike wandavision falcon winter soldier is only six episodes Mm -hmm. so we're already a third of the way there yeah and they kind of dropped like the sister story already right like it's <laughs> they, they spend a good half of the first episode detailing falcon's home life and, and yeah. his financial issues and his ho- sister's whole deal right. to only like doesn't even mention her once in the second episode so it's like the momentum is weird to me in falcon winter soldier yeah. because if you're going to wrap this up you only have four more episodes to wrap this up it's like the justice league right like <laughs> After you got the first hour of the Justice League, you're like, okay, but that really doesn't have anything to do with the last hour of the Justice League. You know? Yeah. And they're spending a lot of time with this, like, funny action comedy buddy vibe, which I get because it's sort of the fun central part mm. of it. But I think they're just going to keep milking that and, like, having the dudes, like, grow up talk each other, like, anytime they need to fill some minutes. Yeah. I don't know. But, I mean, again, and I never read any serious Captain American comics. I just read the dumb ones where he fought, like, wrestlers in the Serpent Society. <laughs> you know, nothing wrong with that. I love the Serpent Society. But, like, but like so when you talk about the red, white, and black storyline, I am not that familiar with that, nor am I familiar with any of the Captain America comic storylines where he really wrestles with America. To be fair, that Red, White, and Black has nothing to do with Steve Rogers, right? Like, this, that story was written to be, like, the Tuskegee experiment version of the Super Soldier Serum, where the government, before they were able to, to refine it for Steve Rogers, had experiment okay. on black soldiers. And then Isaiah Bradley was the only one who survived that and became kind of like the first Captain America predating Steve Rogers. Yeah. And so that that's what that comic is about this like hidden truth of who isaiah brown and i think his descendant ultimately becomes a patriot in the in the young avengers or something yeah so and i was assuming the kid who like opens the door for bucky and sam might be you don't really see his face do you i don't know but i'm thinking maybe he'll be patriot in the future comes patriot but (laughs) you know another guy with a red blue red white and blue (laughs) costume it's kind of (laughs) but i think you you know you kind of you can't bring that up and not address it later so i hope they do i hope they get into like the the meat of not only what that comic was about but again they kind of hint at it like the scene in the bank in the first episode and the scene with the cops in this episode very much talk about what it's like to be a black superhero in the real world and you know yeah do we trust them i don't know i think malcolm spellman has a you know good enough track record that i hope that that's where they go but i you know who knows just like wandavision didn't quite go all the way about like how to deal with grief, right? Like they kind of dropped the ball in the finale in one division where it just became like shooty, yeah. shooty, you know, bang, bang, and not like really dealing with like Wanda 
torturing an entire town full of people just because she was sad you know yeah but we'll see i'll give it four more episodes you know before i can make a final judgment oh yeah i mean it's tons of fun (laughs) yeah i'm not saying and i know i sound like i'm a hater like it's weird that i'm praising a snyder movie and criticizing an mcu (laughs) property but i wonder where they're gonna go and i mean that's the best thing to do right it's going to keep you tuning in every episode if you, you don't know where it's going to go. But the only thing that gives me yeah, pause, no too, is they, they tease Zemo at the end of this one. And so I feel like if you're going to, like, Central Europe in the next episode, you're not going to address all of the race stuff you brought up in the first two episodes, I don't think. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know. I don't know. Who knows? Speaking of Marvel, the other big news has nothing to do with Marvel TV or movies, but Marvel proper. If you guys aren't familiar with the comic book industry, we're going to bore you with some industry talk for the next few minutes. But Marvel Comics announced this week... That they are ditching Diamond Comics distributors and going with Penguin Random House to distribute their comic books. Now, what does this mean if you buy comic books in your comic book store? It means nothing to you if you go to your local shop and pick up your weekly fill of Marvel comics. What it does mean for the industry is that Diamond Comic distributors, which to this point was the only way comic book publishers were able to get their wares into comic book stores, has now in the course of two years lost the big two dc ditched them last summer and now marvel's ditched them this year yeah so diamond no longer has a monopoly on comic distribution what do you feel about that that's huge and i mean i can only imagine it's a cultural change in the lives of the comic shop owners who have been dealing with diamonds without much choice in the matter for quite a while now and um, I, th- I think some of them were not thrilled about it. <laughs> but I mean, I mean I, you, have, you have more knowledge of the inner workings of Diamond and the politics, I, I believe, than I do. But yeah, obviously, <laughs> DC and Marvel, yeah. <laughs> not going through them, <laughs> it's, as, it's as huge as it can get. Big deal. Yeah, uh, full disclosure, I used to work at Diamond Comics over a decade ago now. And it's something that I've said is going to happen in a long time, is that you can't just be a monopoly, right? Like... And especially when you're so reliant on other publishers. Like, once a publisher says, we're going to go a different direction, you're kind of hosed, right? So you do mm-hmm. have to diversify your portfolio as a, as a distribution company. And they've done that. Like, they, they also own Diamond Select Toys, which is a, you know, a collectibles and action figure company where they create and sell their own action figures. And they're in the book market. And they've already lost a lot of the publishers in the book market. You know, Marvel and DC have been doing their book trade business with other distributors for a long time now Hmm. and diamond has said you know you can still they're telling retailers they can still buy their marvel through diamond you know but just now diamond will be a wholesaler where they where they'll be buying the comics from penguin to distribute to comic shops but that's gonna alter the like discount that they give retailers and so you know again the the business model i think has already been kind of like circling the drain for some time Here's my biggest surprise. My biggest surprise is a company like Penguin Random House even wants to get in the direct market business. Like, what benefit does Penguin have to distribute floppy comic books on a weekly basis to comic book retailers? Like, I don't I don't understand right. why they even want to do that. Like, if I'm Penguin, why do I want to do that? Well, that's an excellent question. And I guess, I mean, yeah, because let's be clear, Penguin Random House isn't like some small, scrappy computing. It's, it's like another huge there are satellite another monopolies. publishing industry. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it would, without really knowing the dynamics, it would beg the question, um, since we're phasing out of the monthly pile anyway and edging towards trades, just like people like binge watch tv shows instead of watching them an episode at a time and doesn't that seem more like that's what the that's a trend that uh penguin random house would want to continue i mean i i I guess i'm asking is is the moment on the lifespan of the monthly comic book phasing its way out well that's my point like i feel like with penguin saying we're going to distribute monthly comic books it's almost breathing life into it just because you know if I'm Penguin, again, I wouldn't even get into the business because, like, my idea for the model would be Comixology and, and DC Universe Infinite and Marvel... What is the Marvel and Marvel Unlimited? Mm-hmm. Like, I think the the most cost-effective, the, the, the easiest, most convenient way for people to read comic books is digitally. And that if they like the digital issues that they've read, they could buy the trade if they want to have it on their bookshelf. 
Yeah. I don't know the utility of owning. And I, again, maybe this is, you know, blasphemy for someone at my age, especially who, who does love physical media, but I don't understand yeah. the utility of collecting floppy comic books anymore. If I can yeah. just read them on my iPad and then if I really like the story I read buy the trade paperback or the hardcover to put on my bookshelf, like, yeah, I'm yeah. not buying long box. I haven't bought long boxes in decades. Because I just right. don't want to <laughs> right. have like stacks and stacks of that, floppies, you know. I'd rather have the trades and the right. hardcovers. That used to be a part of the sentimental joy of it. And yeah, I, like like you, I guess I'm sort of two minds of it. I totally love getting the individual issues and that ritual. But also I remember when they were like a dollar. It's it's weird when you're getting, <laughs> you know, a pile of like five dollar, like relatively flimsy little things. But again, yeah. it does get back into the culture of, you know, old school collecting and mm. long boxes and uh, gathering at Comic Con and that kind of thing. So, is are, are we phasing out of that? That's an excellent question because you know now for a year and a half there haven't been gatherings at comic book stores or conventions. And to your question earlier about what does it mean to go back to a normal, a normalcy, we're seeing that now, yeah, right? With the it. vaccinations and we have a new administration and people are getting better and and not being as afraid of covid the president has said that by may all adults should be vaccinated by july we could actually have a relative normal existence that we haven't felt in in two years and because of that comic-con international has announced they're going to hold an in-person san diego comic-con in november whoa (laughs) which is wild because not just any date in November, but the Friday, Saturday, Sunday after Thanksgiving. So <laughs> I know there's some consternation from like comic book <laughs> journalists and pop culture critics that like, wait, we got to give up our Thanksgiving weekend to travel to fucking San Diego. I hadn't heard this, but they, they do know it in the press release that it's Thanksgiving, right? They're not like ignorant. Of, oh, no, of they're saying they're saying holiday. Comic-Con coming Thanksgiving weekend. So like they know okay. that like Black Friday means going to Comic-Con this year. <laughs> i'm of two minds about it like okay please <laughs> i already know i'm not going so it's no skin off my teeth right like i'm not did i say that it's skin off my back whatever i'm not going either way so like have fun in san diego but i'm spending my thanksgiving at home and i actually don't think the in-person comic-con is going to be like what we think of when we think of san diego comic-con like mm-hmm. i doubt it's going to be the big studios and the big pop-ups and the big yeah. crowds of people i think it's going to be a local show for the city of san diego yeah that's it what might I not be michael bay taking over an aircraft for like late night parties is what you're saying that's what i'm saying okay which is probably fine yeah <laughs> do, you, do you do you envision this more like you know back to comic-con mark one when it was just dudes yeah. with long boxes i think so i think then... it's like what was it 1971 yeah. or something when the first comic-con was like i feel like it may feel more like that. Like I don't think there will be a big Hall H, right? Yeah, sure. Because I don't know what the what is the Hall, what Hall is H the... is ultimate super spreader non protocol right. compl- just big. Yeah, big I mean category. even if even if COVID is under control by the fall, and that's I think in the press release too. Like they're assuming that by November, the reason they're doing it in November, not July, is that they're hoping that gives extra time for cities and counties to vaccinate their people, but. I don't know. I think I I get why people are upset about having Comic Con on Thanksgiving weekend. I would be more mad at my like editor if my editor sends me to Comic Con on Thanksgiving, right? right? And I get that. I get that. But I'm I would be more mad at my editor than Comic Con. But I don't right? Know. No, no. It's a really difficult one. It's it's you can't really like say you know good or idea or bad idea. But I mean, I think <laughs> I think they should at least require that everyone be masked. <laughs> <laughs> i mean and it being comic-con maybe that'll be just fine <laughs> like you can't I, come in unless you're cosplaying right <laughs> yeah exactly like i don't know about you like i i feel like the superhero fan culture like didn't do some work it should have done in the last couple of years somehow because when the mask mandates came up like some people thought it was like not cool and it's just like wait i just walk going around in this culture where shouldn't wearing a mask be cool right now if if superheroes are the hottest thing in pop culture i mean if i'm a cobra trooper cosplayer this is my time to shine exactly (laughs) shit like that like the cobra troopers made that shit look good 40 years ago you know you just need a blue suit 
Yeah, and it should normalize it for society. Like this is well, maybe not COVID troopers exactly, but but, yeah, I mean, but they did have some cool, very uh, effective full face masks. And but but they should be like on the PR front, going, yeah, masks are cool, dude. It's a, a way to express yourself in society. We just walk around like this. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I I'm like so much can happen between now and November too. So who knows if that yeah. date will hold? But. If it doesn't hold, it also means like we're going through some more terrible shit in this country. So that's also a possibility. But anyway, that's that on that. Before we head over to Sophia and her interview with the Supergirl show writers, what's nerd popping for you, Dominic Ma? Oh, what's nerd popping for me? I watched Nomad Land, directed by Chloe Zhao. Nice. Successful on Hulu. The favorite right to win the Oscar this year. Yeah, it's kind of the stars are aligning like it might win all the awards. She might particularly win win a bunch of the awards for uh, this film, which again is totally docudrama, like real person shit, as far from the kind of movies we talk about on the show as you can get. And it's wonderfully done, but at the same time, you see the visual style, you see the sort of big landscapes and people, you know, navigating them. And you can tell that her big ensemble Marvel movie will probably be good. <laughs> you can see the, you know, the instruments for that at work. You know, and it's funny because we've talked just on this episode about how Marvel shies away from like big directorial visions in their properties, right? Like it's Kevin Feige runs it and then typically hires n- no shade, but like TV directors, right? The Russo brothers cut their teeth on television. Right. Well, I mean, I have a comment about that, but please continue. <laughs> I mean, it started off with like, Branagh and, and Favreau and like yeah I mean my comment is, it, but like my comment is the fact that they I mean they pick people who are good with human stuff still they, I mean they pick the appropriate directors personality wise for the job they just don't play the like from the mind of from the visionary directorship in the PR that much right that they don't play that card as much but you can but you can also like you can't tell me like the directorial style of whoever the fuck directed Thor the Dark World. Yeah, that one wasn't as... <laughs> you know, but, the, but my point is that, but like in recent years, right? Ryan Coogler's stamp is all over Black Panther. Yeah. Taika Waititi's stamp is all over Ragnarok. James Gunn, as we talked about this episode, his stamp is all over Guardians. So like they are giving more kind of like leeway, I feel like, to directors. And so that someone like a Chloe Zhao, who is a very visionary auteur, could do a, an Eternals movie and perhaps make it sit outside the kind of like house style. Cause that's my, my criticism of yeah. Marvel movies has always been the visual. I think you're absolutely right that they can, you know, get at the humanity of characters, but like even Joss Whedon was a TV guy. Yeah. Right. And he, and he frames his compositions very much like a TV show. That's the biggest difference between his cut of justice league and the Snyder cut for all of its flaws. The Snyder cut feels cinematic it feels big in the opening, and yeah, the universe feels terribly silly. Yeah, right. Even in a vertical aspect ratio, it feels more cinematic. Yeah, Joss is like you know kind of thing, yeah. and I'm actually giving Feige credit by giving like real direct. Not again, not that like the Russos aren't real directors or anything like that, but like you know people with auteur visions, like a Chloe Zhao, who's going to fucking win the Oscar. Yeah, very likely. You know, to helm a Marvel movie, like. That's awesome. I'm I'm yeah. totally And I mean there's gossip that she over delivered on her version of the Eternals, which is interesting and, you know, heartening because the Eternals is a risky property because again, big cosmic subsection of the Marvel universe that doesn't have like a leading character that people super care about. Right. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't have an automatic in, it doesn't have this built in fan base. It's an equivalent lift to lifting the Guardians of Galaxy. Yeah and their hodgepodge bunch of characters to memorable household name status. And it just might happen. Yeah. Anyway, so we'll see on that point. But what, what's nerd popping for you, Keith? So for me, I've been watching the first few episodes of Amazon Studios' Invincible. It's an animated series based on Robert Kirkman's comic book of the same name. And I dig it. You know, like, it's a very much an R-rated animated series about a teenager who comes into his superpowers... And he's the son of their their world Superman, basically. And what's cool about the show is that in the comics, they never talk about the ethnicity of the characters. But in the show, they specifically cast Steven Yeun, another Oscar nominee, as Indeed. Mark Grayson, the lead character, Invincible. 
And so in doing so, they cast Sandra Oh to play his mom. J.K. Simmons plays Omni-Man, which is their world, Superman. And so that's kind of cool that this show centers around an Asian-American superhero. There's nothing actually culturally mm-hmm. Asian-American about them in the show. Like, it's it, it's kind of like the criticism where you just put an Asian face on a white character. But I kind of, you know, I do have right. issues with that because, like, white characters just te- typically are whatever. They can be whatever. That, that was my whole Asian Iron Fist argument is that, like, a character's whiteness isn't inherent in who he is. So if yeah. you make that character Asian American, by default, he becomes, you know, Asian American. Like, I, I hate the fact that like, I've, I've heard criticism like, well, there's nothing, they're not doing anything Asian. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> like you want him to walk around drinking boba tea and that will make it more Asian. Like get the fuck out of here. Right. But I don't know. I, I say that as someone who, who tries to shot, I don't like Sriracha and I hate boba tea. So I'm not Asian either, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> But the the show like the comic those, that's not those aren't the defining tests. Well, exactly. <laughs> it's not a big thing. But the show like its comic book counterpart is very much in the tonal cognitive dissonance of typical superhero story, very much in the Spider Man realm of teenager dealing with having superpowers, with like gory ultra violence that Robert Kirkman is also known for from The Walking Dead, right? Like. So they're in these brightly colored yeah. costumes. It's like the Titans dilemma, right? They're in these brightly colored costumes flying around and then someone's face will explode. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. And then like viscera and guts just fly everywhere. And it's like, oh, it's like that, you know? So Superheroing gets too real. Yeah, and it's kind of like, you know, the boys I get. Like you go into the boys knowing you're going to see some twisted shit. Like on the surface, Invincible doesn't look like something... It looks appealing to like tweens. Okay. And I just feel it's like it's again the Titans dilemma. Like but if I don't know anything about it and I would start watching Invincible and then someone's face gets ripped off, I'm gonna be like, oh, okay. <laughs> but I mean, I'm not that familiar. That's my puritanical properly. take on superheroes. Is it more off-putting because it's animated? Because that's uh, that's what I am like while watching the DC animated movies. Sometimes I want to pop in. Oh, I haven't seen this particular Justice League movie, but you don't know whether it's like the dark strain or the family-oriented <laughs> strain. Right. And the dark strain, people's heads get chopped off quite a bit. Yeah. No, it's weird though, right? Because like animation shouldn't automatically mean kid-friendly. Like I get. Oh yeah, that. not at all. You know, like I mean, anime. Half of anime, three quarters of anime is not kid-friendly. You know, but it's not just that. I think it's the the way it's animated. It looks like an accessible all ages show. Mm-hmm. just on the surface like if you knew nothing about it you know i could see a parent going oh timmy would yeah. like this and then yeah the color palettes I, right the costume, which is the titans ways, yeah. dilemma as i said like if you, yeah, you, yeah, no one similar. tunes into the boys thinking this is for kids right. right but invincible could be misconstrued that way which again i don't fault Kirk- kirkman's book is like that you know mm-hmm. and speaking of my time at diamond i feel like i may have even like recommended it for children not knowing what the book was about at the time <laughs> So, you know, anyway. Well, the moral of that is just don't ever recommend anything for children. Yeah, exactly. Recommend children can't recommend things because you like, like them. No, it's just like, don't presume. Like, it's, that doesn't. Yeah, pretty much. Just recommend things because you like it, but so don't make that extra like, oh, this is very well oriented for this child's development. Right. <laughs> no, one, no one can know that. Yeah, I guess that's true. Well, that's it for this week. If you stay tuned after the break, you'll hear Sophia's interview with the Supergirl showrunners and then join us right after that. I'm Sophia Soto, and I'm happy to be joined by the showrunners of The CW Supergirl, whose final season premiere is this Tuesday at 9 p.m. Please welcome to the Nerds of Color, Robert Rovner and Jessica Queller. Hey, Sophia. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Robert. How are you both today? We try to be super at all times. (laughs) (laughs) The Nerds of Color love to hear that. (laughs) Big congrats for you guys both on the success of Supergirl and it heading into its final season. It returns on Tuesday. What can fans expect from this final season? I think that, you know, we wanted to take the opportunity of this season to really allow it to close out Kara's story in a way that Kara deserves. And that speaks to the message of the show, which has been about hope, help, and compassion. And, uh, you know, we want it to be a very exciting and emotional ride for the audience. On the themes of this season, we decided are really centering on power and the abuse of power and the limits of power both from without and within, meaning that even our super friends are going to be addressing 
how limitless their power is, and even when facing bigger threats than they've yet seen in the previous season, where do they draw the line? When does it become an abuse of power, and, and who gets to decide who's the arbiter? So those are kind of the thematic stories we'll be telling. And I think the ultimate message we want to land on is that the show, you know, is about living your authentic life and empowering people. And at the end of the day, how do our superheroes help empower everybody to feel oh, no. power? No, that's going to be a really important message. So I'm really excited to hear about that. What is your biggest goal when highlighting strong female characters and how do you go about achieving it? Because obviously, you know, you have such strong females on the show. The show is female led, which is so crucial in today's television industry. Our biggest goal is, and I don't know if this is the right phrase, right, is to have really positive role models for young women to see and emulate and, and want to be like and, and to see that really women can do anything and women can be heroes and they can stand up for what's right. And they are fearless and brave and all the things that are really true about us. So a lot of our stories are a metaphor because not all of us can fly and catch bullets and stuff like that. But in our own way, we can. And I think, as Robert said, you know, the, the takeaway from the season is that every, we want every single person to be empowered and, and certainly we're a female sense of show. So that lands heavily on, on women and girls, but um, on everyone. And that, that the only way that this world is going to be a better place is that each of us individually own our power and contribute to making the world a better place. What do you want Supergirl's legacy to be after the show ends? Well, I think it's a lot of what Jessica just said. You know, I think that the legacy is inspiring hope and inspiring people to feel their own power. Definitely. And, and their own agency. I think the legacy is that we're all in this together, and it, it really does take a village. It, it takes each of us participating and doing our best with a pure heart. And, you know, we, we hope that Supergirl on the show is, is, is inspiring for people to kind of live their lives in the spirit of Supergirl. Did you both always know when and how you wanted to end the show? Or was there sort of a process for you both to come up with a satisfying ending? There was a process, along with the writers and Greg Berlanti and Sarah Schechter, really, and, and even with Melissa, you know, really yeah. talked about what we wanted the, the legacy, as you just asked, of Supergirl to be and to craft a, a season that really spoke to that and really thumbed up the series as a whole. And so that's, you know, that's what the season is driving at to really land that in a profound way. Since, you know, Supergirl is obviously part of the DC comic world, how did you go about using those comics as the source material for her character in the show? And how did you sort of play with that? Well, you know, we've always used the wonderful comics as inspiration and then kind of crafted our own drama fired by that. You know, it was no different this time around. We're always kind of using, you know, those stories as, as a way to, you know, to inform the stories that we want to tell. What has been your favorite relationship, whether it be romantic or otherwise, to develop on the show and why? And for me, the, the, the core central relationships of the show are the two sisters, or Alice and Kara, and having uh, one sister or two sisters in my family, I find it really emotional, you know, the feeling of needing to take care of each other, and then, of course, the frustration when you feel know, like the other sibling is too controlling, but there's, there's something about having a sibling, and especially, you know, two women, I think it's very special and profound and the pilot on has really been the, the heart of the series. Beautifully said. What would you both like to tell the fans that have been watching the show since day one? How much we appreciate the fans. We're excited about the season and hopefully they'll both be entertained by it, but also kind of take the message of it and be inspired by it as much as we're inspired by Kara herself. You know, all of us in the writer's room I feel are inspired by her, you know, in, that, in many ways. With the show ending, there's so much sort of riding on those final moments. 
to tie everything together, would you say there are many sort of full circle and parallel moments throughout the final season? Yeah, I mean, I think we haven't, we're still uh, in the midst of breaking those final episodes. But what we have planned, you know, really, I, especially for Kara, we'll take her full circle from the pilot and, uh, you know, you know, hopefully have emotional resolve for all of the characters, you know, because we're all invested in everybody's happiness. And then lastly, for you guys, do you guys have a powerful moment that stands out to you throughout the entire series or maybe a quote or a moment or a storyline that just means a lot to you? No, I, I think I'm most excited about this season. You know, I'm excited about the very emotional beginning of it. And then, you know, the things that we're facing in the second half, uh, the stories that we're telling, the stories that both uh, speak to a lot of the issues that we're facing in our own world and how we can kind of learn from Supergirl's experience of dealing with that. We're, we're doing a lot of social justice stories with seniors, but some of them were inspired very directly by the Black Lives Matter movement and the events of last summer, and I think those mean a tremendous amount to us. I'm also really personally invested in the stories we told with Mia and you know, being a trans woman superhero, you know, I, I think the, the stories about representation and inclusion, I think, really are very personal for all of us in writers. Definitely. And you guys have been doing a fantastic job. So thank you so much, Jessica and Robert, for sitting down to talk to me and the Nerds of Color and doing this interview. And congrats on the success that's about to come on Tuesday because uh, the premiere was fantastic. Thank you, oh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, guys. You. All right. That was the Supergirl showrunner. The final season premiere is this Tuesday at nine o'clock on the CW. Thank you all for listening to the Nerds of Color Hard Knock Life this week. Before we sign off, Dominic Ma, how can people find you on the interwebs? Oh, I'm Dominic Ma, and you can find me at Dom Ma, D-O-M-M-A-H. And I am Keith Chow. You can find me on Twitter at The Real Chow, the underscore real underscore Chow. Follow the Nerds of Color at the Nerds of Color and go to hardknockmedia.com to find this and all of the podcasts in the Hard Knock Network, including Southern Fried Asian, my podcast about growing up Asian American in the South. The newest episode features Perry Young, the star of warrior and the new film boogie talks about growing up in rural texas so check that episode out at hardknockmedia.com subscribe and download at apple Podcasts, google play spotify stitcher anywhere you get podcasts subscribe to us on the nerds colors youtube channel youtube.com slash the nerds color where you can find audio versions of these podcasts as well as all the cool videos interviews from jamal and patrick again that's youtube.com slash the nerds of color support us on patreon and go fund me and buy merch at t public and until next time restore the amanda wallerverse <laughs> stay safe everybody